This is a picture of Jones Beach in New York in 1945, and this giant scary cloud is DDT, a pesticide that was sprayed on forests, livestock, and children, leaving piles of dead mosquitoes, poisoned fish, and dead baby eagles in its wake. Sort of. See, during World War II, DDT was used to kill mosquitoes that spread diseases like malaria. It worked so well that it became one of the most commonly used pesticides in the US. The manufacturers even promoted it with ads saying things like, DDT is good for me. What they didn't know at the time was that DDT was decidedly not good for anything. Sure, it killed disease-carrying mosquitoes, fleas, and lice, but it also poisoned the rest of the food chain, put bald eagles on the brink of extinction since it made them lay eggs with thin shells that easily broke or didn't hatch, and increased the risk of cancer and other diseases for generations of humans. Then, in 1972, the Environmental Protection Agency banned DDT, and these days our beaches are delightfully DDT-free. So having the right laws and regulations in place is key for fixing our environmental concerns. Except that DDT law wouldn't have happened without an environmental movement, and that movement wouldn't have happened without a book, which wouldn't have happened without a letter, which wouldn't have happened without a bunch of dead birds, which wouldn't have happened without all that DDT. So where does change start? Or to ask an age-old question, what comes first, the eagle or the egg? Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. When it comes to turning things around for the environment, laws and regulations can go a long way in changing our actions and perceptions. But those laws and regulations, the eagles, if you will, can exist in a vacuum. There's a whole bunch of paper-thin DDT-ravaged eagle's eggs, or action, from the rest of us that has to happen for those laws to be effective. And when the eagles of law and regulation are effective, it can lay a whole bunch more community eggs. And that's true whether we're looking at that one eagle's nest down the street or all the nests in the world. Let's start with a local nest. Common pool resources are things like water in rivers or marine fisheries that everyone can access. They're great, but the more people consume a common pool resource, the less there is for everyone else. And eagles have a hard time making sure that doesn't happen, and fixing it when it does. It can be really difficult and expensive to come up with regulations to limit the usage of common pool resources or convince people to use them differently, especially when they rely on a common resource to survive. So local common pool resources are often best managed by the eggs, the community itself. That's what the Nobel Prize-winning political scientist Eleanor Ostrom believed in. Anyway, Ostrom didn't like to see communities getting stuck in these loops of destroying their own resources. She saw it play out over and over as people misused groundwater in Los Angeles throughout the late 20th century. So in 1990, she documented examples of local communities that did the opposite. They set out guidelines about who could use resources and how they could be used. Based on this fieldwork, Ostrom developed a set of eight principles for managing shared resources sustainably and fairly through grassroots efforts at the local level. Ostrom explains that to protect common resources, communities have to work together to determine who gets access to what and set boundaries that fit the needs of the community. This helps limit the free-for-all, storm-the-buffet mentality that can happen. So take Leo and Marta. They both make their living by catching and selling shrimp in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana. But Marta's boat is much bigger than Leo's and has more nets, so she could catch more shrimp than he can in a day. Except that they're both part of the Louisiana Shrimp Task Force. That sounds like the Avengers for shrimp, but it's actually a state-sanctioned regulatory organization that invites all Louisiana shrimpers to get involved in managing the fishery. So the Shrimp Task Force is sort of an eagle egg that's acting like an eagle. The task force is a local organization that helps enforce boundaries that keep shrimp populations healthy. So they make sure people are following licensing requirements, harvest regulations, and shrimp handling methods. Gently, and with gloves, of course. For instance, if Marta teams up with other commercial fishers to sell her catch, she'll have to get additional licenses. But Leo's licensing requirements won't be as rigorous since he plans to sell his catch directly to the hungry masses of Louisiana. That makes sure that smaller shrimp sellers won't get crowded out by bigger sellers and keeps everyone honest about how much shrimp they're catching and selling. The Shrimp Task Force holds open meetings where fisher folk like Leo and Marta can ask questions and contribute ideas for regulating the industry. When people have a say in making the rules, they're more likely to follow them. In Ostrom's words, the community should be able to weigh in on how boundaries are set. Then, once those guidelines are set, communities need to hold each other accountable for their actions. For Leo and Marta, that means having their catches inspected to make sure they're not taking more shrimp than they're allowed, and aren't catching other animals like turtles by accident. When people do mess up, Ostrom explains that sanctions should be graduated, or ramp up over time. So maybe the first violation is a warning, and the next is a small fine. The goal is to help people learn from their actions, not send them immediately to shrimp jail without shrimp bail. But because people are people, there's bound to be disagreements sometimes. So 
when people don't agree with the rules, like if Marta doesn't think she should have to apply for more licenses or Leo wants to be able to catch turtles too, they should have the opportunity to resolve conflicts. According to Ostrom, all of that is possible because communities like Louisiana shrimpers should have the right to organize. When eagles, larger governments like the state of Louisiana, acknowledge the eggs, rules set by smaller communities, it gives those people the right to set boundaries and enforce rules. That's also Ostrom's last principle at work, cooperation. Protecting common pool resources works best when everyone from the shrimpers to the owner of the all-you-can-eat shrimp buffet work together to protect the resources and everyone who depends on them. So in this case, the actions of the shrimpers are key for changing how we use common pool resources. But that couldn't happen without the support of the Shrimp Task Force and the Louisiana government. And the regulations those organizations set wouldn't be effective without the cooperation of the shrimpers. Ostrom's principles aren't perfect, but they encourage regulations and collaborations, eagles and eggs, that give everyone a fair piece of the common pool resources quiche. For people like Leo and Marta, that means they can access what they need to support themselves while protecting resources for generations to come. But in some cases, we need to apply these principles on a much larger scale. When that's the case, the eagles need to flash their talons, spread their wings, and get down to business. In other words, governments can pass laws or create regulations around issues like pollution and resource use to protect the common resources of an entire state or country. In the US, laws have been an important tool in helping us protect the environment. But again, the eagle can't live in a vacuum. Those laws only work because of the community of eggs. There's a lot of back and forth between people, organizations, and the government. That's what happened in the case of DDT. In 1958, a biologist and nature writer named Rachel Carson got a letter from a friend who lived in Massachusetts. Her friend explained that DDT was killing birds at a nearby bird sanctuary and encouraged her to investigate. Over the next four years, Carson learned about all the different ways DDT is good for me was a lie. She published her findings in a book called Silent Spring, a reference to how DDT stripped the seasons of birdsong. When her book hit shelves in 1962, it sent shockwaves through the American public. Suddenly, people realized that the pesticides used to grow their food and keep bugs away from their kids on the beach could be harming them and the environment, too. This helped spark the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s, where citizens pressured their leaders to make changes that protected citizens, the economy, and the environment. That movement and egg led to the creation of important eagles, the environmental laws we rely on today, like the Clean Air Act in 1970 that limited emissions to improve the air we breathe, and the Clean Water Act, which created pollution control programs and water quality standards. But those eagles also laid eggs. The laws and guidelines helped protect the environment and empowered more people to continue working together to push for other sustainability changes. This cycle of communities questioning the status quo, governments introducing new regulations, and everybody changing perspectives can work on an even larger scale, too. Take the Amazon rainforest. In the last 50 years, the Amazon has lost a fifth of its forest cover, an area larger than the state of Texas. That's a problem because a lot of indigenous and local people depend on the forest for their survival. But it's also bad for everyone on Earth because removing trees makes it harder for the Amazon to soak up carbon dioxide. In fact, in recent years, the Amazon has emitted more carbon dioxide than it absorbs. And like everything else we've talked about, Solving this problem takes both eagles and eggs. In this case, the eggs are the Brazilian people and organizations, ranging from nonprofits to indigenous activists to Brazilian companies that have been fighting to save their rainforests for nearly 40 years, working together to advocate for conservation. The road to progress hasn't quite been smooth soaring, but in 2023, those eggs produced an eagle. Brazil's president, Lula da Silva, issued a set of orders aimed at stopping Amazonian deforestation. Thanks to da Silva's orders, deforestation dropped 55% by the end of 2023. And this set of laws also created new collaborations collaborations with countries that rely on the Amazon River Basin, like Colombia, Peru, and Venezuela. Their governments work to stop illegal mining and create new, more sustainable jobs for their citizens in areas like forest tourism and production of bioenergy. And those regulations and policies affect how citizens live and work in these countries. Citizens, companies, and governments all work together to come up with solutions that would include both environmental and economic policies and also take into account the needs and concerns of people living in these areas. And the future is looking a little brighter because of it. But it doesn't always work that way. Officials in Michigan, for example, have spent years under fire for a water crisis in the majority black city of Flint. That tragedy exposed 100,000 people to lead contaminated water in 2014. And a decade later, the problems haven't been completely resolved. Problems like that are common for communities of color, which tend to get left out of the decision-making processes. And if we learned one thing from DDT, it's that when you weaken the eggs, the eagles suffer too and the people, which is maybe the bigger issue in this case. And all the big, bad legal eagles that have protected us for decades aren't safe from changing political tides, either. In 2023, the US Supreme Court heard a case called Sackett v. EPA. The court ruled that millions of acres of wetland that were formerly protected under the Clean Water Act no longer fall under the EPA's protection. That puts even more communities drinking water at risk for pollution. As we look to the future, there's no one simple formula that will turn things around for the environment. We can't sit and wait for the eagles to swoop in and save us. But even the strongest egg won't make it without a little help from the eagle. In other words, it 
takes letters and books and movements and laws, which lead to more letters and books and movements and laws. We might not know exactly where change starts, but we can build on what's come before to keep changing things for the better. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment your favorite bird, I'm partial to the loon, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, see you next time.